Welcome to Let's Deconstruct a Story, a podcast for the story nerds. I'm Kelly Forden. Today we're talking with Catherine Vaz, winner of the Drew Hines Literature Prize, Prairie Schooner Award, and many more awards about her story, Our Lady of the Artichokes. Please see my website at kellyforden.com for the full text of the story. And please do read it before listening to this discussion, which is chock full of spoilers. One last thing, I'm running a Let's Deconstruct a Story class for the first 10 people who sign up at my website, kellyforden.com. Check the store on the site for more info. We'll be talking about some of my all-time favorite stories, and I'd love to see you there. And now, Catherine Vaz. Well, we're talking about Our Lady of the Artichokes, uh, which is an amazing short story. And I thought I would just start by, I mean, everybody will have read the story, but just a little background on the scene where Isabel and Tia Connie um, are coming from um, and where they're, the place they're living in San Francisco now, just how you would describe their situation. Well, it this actually is based on a lot of very real things in my life, which is I did have a great aunt um, named Concepcion, which is Connie, or in Spanish, it would be Concepcion. Um, and she lived in an apartment building that by coincidence or happenstance had a lot of widows and single women who were from the Azores, San Leandro, California is a town near Berkeley. It's adjacent to Oakland that once upon a time had two thirds Portuguese people in it. My father, whose family came from the Azores taught at uh, San Leandro High School. Of course, this is vastly different now. This is a story I wrote in 2004. So life Mm -hmm. has changed quite a lot. But she was kind of the grand lady of the apartment building and watched out for things. And one day um, they got that notice that we all fear, which was, oh, by the way, you're all going to be evicted because we're going to convert this old building into expensive condos that none of you single old women can afford. But she said kind of half as a joke, half seriously, ugh. We should paint the Virgin Mary on the outside wall. It'll be a miracle. It'll be a shrine. No one will <laughs> no one'll make us leave. And I thought, of course, she wasn't going to do that. But I thought, you know, that would make a very funny story. So she was very old world. You know, there were there were things she would do. Like she had a statue of St. Anthony, who's the patron saint of Portugal and love. And he's a very busy saint uh, for that reason. And she would put him head down in her laundry basket when she was mad at a friend <laughs> because he wasn't thinking hard enough how to help her. You know, a lot of funny things happened. But this story I did, you know, long ago to kind of encapsulate, I didn't realize it fully till 20 years have now gone by, the dread and the fear of losing your home. The story originally was from the point of view of the young niece she's adopted, that it's her, she takes care of her. She's high school age. Um, She doesn't know about love. She's been abandoned. She's got this old world woman in this modern world. How do you encompass that? And yet she's entranced by, you might say, the system of belief that subscribes to a kind of realistic magic. I mean, my, my great aunt really did believe, you know, that prayer uh, works. And, you know, so so the story actually also encompassed, there were two significant things that happened in her life. One is that she did trip on the floor one day, break her neck. And the doctor said, you know, Senora Valadon, do you realize you've snapped the vertebrae that the executioner tries to break when he oh my god and she said Ugh, you know send me home and that was kind of you know that was sort of a little tiny miracle but the real miracle in her life was she was single a long time there was a tragedy i think in her early days where someone she was in love with in the azores i think died and she never married she was the virgin until she met somebody who came to to her door, came into her life, and she had him for 10 years before he died of leukemia. So he was the real miracle. So 
it was kind of trying to enshrine this story and pay homage to a kind of magic that existed in the world I grew up in, a belief system, also a lot of humor, by the way, because I hope people laugh when they read the story as well. It continues to delight me and will for the rest of my life that Alexander Chi heard me read this story in um, actually in Lisbon and laughed a lot as everyone else did and then cried at the end. So he gave me a blurb for my novel that's coming out in November above the salt. And he gave me a quote that said, she made me cry in public, which is yeah. something treasure. So let, let, let me pause there and draw a breath and, and see if I answered your question properly. And um, Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Did you say, did you live with her or you, or you just, I actually did, did not. You did I, not live with that her. That is fictional. That's okay. fictional. I, my father, August Vaz, was very prominent in the Portuguese American community, which is also referred to, by the way, as the Luso or Lusa female uh, American community, because Portugal, the old Roman word for it was Lusitania. So, so the loose American world, my father was a, a prominent figure because he was a beloved history teacher. Um, he gave lectures on Portuguese culture. There was an enormous settlement of people, mostly from the Azores in the Bay Area, you know, also San Jose and the Valley towns of California, San Diego. And my father was very prominent in that. And so I grew up around these stories and, you know, I, I grew up, you know, with, I realized at one point that I was very lucky. I had very loving parents and who let us be whatever we wanted to be in the world. I had to go away and teach college before I realized that was definitely not the case with a lot of uh, young people. And, you know, my father said to me one day, we have poets in our community, people write essays, I write history, but there's so many stories and no one seems to be writing them. Yeah. And I took that. And so this is fiction, but it is drawing from this incident that I think as a Californian, I was very alert to, and we all are now in the world everywhere, that some of the institutions we think of is solid, like things like home, things like place, the culture uh, can be taken from us very suddenly and dramatically. Mm -hmm. And so as I've become older, the story, what brings it to the fore for me even more is this sense of precariousness. I think displacement is one of the great themes of the 21st century. And, you know, this story is now 20 years old and I've done an evolving screenplay from it, shall we say, and more and more and more from the point of view of the older woman, of Connie. Mm -hmm. And I didn't fully realize because I was a child when all this happened that she was scared to death. And, you know, my father was so worried about her going to a care facility at that point. And quite magically enough, this didn't make it into the story, but she goes in, she hears someone talking down the hall and she said, oh my gosh, it was someone from her village in the Azores already in that home. So wow. she asked if she could be a roommate. So we thought, okay, that turned out nicely. <laughs> um, but she had this beautiful love story in the middle of her life. And I always said that, you know, forget about the Virgin Mary saving the building. That was the real miracle. Yeah, that is. Yeah. So you have this narrator who is Isabel. And I love this Isabel Serpa. Is that how you say it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, 17 year old smoker, a roller of my eyes at mass to convey that I believed nothing would report the sighting. My infidel status gave me more credibility. And what it is, is Tia Connie decides that Isabel is the one who's going to tell everybody that the Virgin Mary is <laughs> appearing, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. And uh, so how did you come up with Isabel as the narrator? Or was it just that you, you were, you, you know, it was 20 years ago, you were young when you were writing it, and you were kind of thinking of just a niece, like, like yeah, I was older than Isabel is in the story, of course, and I've never been a smoker. But I, I, um, 
you know, that kind of sensibility of looking at the old world belief systems around me. And I grew up in the 60s and 70s in Northern California. So it was a real clash of belief systems, cultures. And, and I did have parents who wanted us to be who we were in the world. So coming up with how they get, but they love each other, these two. They really love each other in that practical, often exasperated way. Uh, they live in a small apartment together. It's crowded with all this stuff. I mean, I grew up when Catholic families tended to have President Kennedy. Yep. Christ, <laughs> hope all together on yeah. the wall. I, you know. I, I'm Irish, so we. Oh, okay. Had the same the same thing. Thing. Yeah, yeah, and like the the Jesus with the bloody heart. The whole yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. I've had yeah. that, and um, you know, I, I was five years old in 1960, and our kindergarten held an election for president, and I went home. I remember going home to my parents and saying that Kennedy would win because that's who I voted for, and oh. they thought that was adorable. It's weird to um, think back on how magical. That's one of the things I really loved about the story is all the magic, you know, and that is something that I've become totally secular. I'm not religious anymore. Uh, But that part of it, I miss, you know, like all because the world world took on this, you know, no matter what was happening to you, you could you could bury St. Joseph in the backyard and then, you know, you'd sell your house or you you could say I, I remember my grandmother or my great grandmother didn't think she would die till Saturday. And then she held mm-hmm. on till Saturday because then you get straight into heaven, you know? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, they're all this funny, you know, it's very funny when I, half it's a joke and half not, when my husband, Chris Surf and I sold the house we lived in before where we are now, I did bury a St. Joseph in the yard. <laughs> we did too. <laughs> I mean, that day we got an offer. Um so, and still, you know, I was taught St. Anthony, St. Anthony, please look around and then what's lost will soon be found. Absolutely. And never. Yes. <laughs> um, so it, it it's kind of, I think there's a danger in making that too charmed a system. I look at it as you do, I think, you know, that kind of secular, but, oh, this is nice. I, I'm a believer. I've taught courses in magical realism and To me, it's a belief system that real things in the world, it's not fantasy, real things in the world have these mystical or magical qualities. For example, there are things that are possible, but maybe not probable. We know people of sound mind who say they've seen ghosts. So perhaps there are these interstices in in life that really, really do exist. They're uh, real things. I'll tell you a little story that is a family story. And in fact, I used it for the beginning of the novel I have coming out uh, in November, which is that I had a branch of my family in the Azores that were very, very hungry. And they were taught to sing when they were hungry as a way of eating their music, distracting themselves But also in a practical way, it signaled to the neighbors that without asking for charity, that they could use some assistance. So part of my family got known as um, the little birds, Uh and that was a nickname that stuck. So is that magical? That was a real thing. Mm -hmm. So I think luck has these magical real moments. We all have them. We all have them that that if we look at, we think it's partly the wonder of the world and it's partly occurrences that have that extraordinary quality. Right. Yeah. I think in fiction when I, um, and I'm, I love your book, by the way, but we'll talk about it. Okay. But um, yeah, I love it. I was thinking that I can, in terms of magical realism, I'm all, all along for the ride, as long as the person doesn't try and solve the problem, you know, or tell me what, you know, is actually happening. Like sometimes people can get very you mean, show the show the props or the or the yeah behind the the curtain. Yeah, exactly. Like well, also you know, or try and define it as like you know 
Catholicism is the one true religion or, you know, whatever. Oh, right, right. right. Yeah. I know all oh, those things. Of course, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I, I love the magic of it. And, and when a ghost sort of appears or um, a saint or some, or a miraculous happening, and then you just allow it to happen in the story without trying to explain where it comes from. I mean, because none of us knows, right? So that's the part where I think you lose your secular audience when you try and explain it. Uh, exactly. And also when you get, as you say, fervent about it. In right. This, yeah, it, it it is lending credence, I think, to the idea that inexplicable things happen in the world, which is uh, partly the beauty of fiction is a way of, of celebrating that of going into those empty spaces or the invisible world. I mean, I think even interior interiorities in fiction mm -hmm. have that magical quality because fiction exists in part so that we can use the language we never get to in real life. And it's that kind of sharing of a mm -hmm. musicality or mutual sense that connects us. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, well, in so to talk about what happens in the story, um, Tia Connie decides that she's going to use the pastry, fl <laughs> the pastry flame to, <laughs> yeah, torch to <laughs> torch Mary onto the side of the building, and then, and it's so funny. So even though Isabel can't quite bring herself to announce this they just start to gather anyway right from the laundromat and and the ladies gather and they're praying and <laughs> yes i mean in part it's a kind of down-to-earth secular idea that if a bunch of women just kneel and have this kind of protest and a mass mm -hmm. for something it's going to look strange to be hauled off you know all these old women praying, you know, having them hauled off uh, lends visibility to who right. they are. And in a real practical secular way, I think Connie is aware that, you know, she's kind of the master of this building that will probably not win this one, but we'll go, we'll go out protesting. We'll mm -hmm. go out as a group and seize the power of that. And it'll delay it at the very at the very least. It will delay the inevitable because he. That, that's right. And yeah. the story was written, of course, before you could record things on cell phones or that you could post things online. <laughs> and it, it, oddly enough, when I've been doing this screenplay play for for a number of years now, I, I've I've added all that in as something that escalates the tensions and the issues. At the same time, California and other places have um, instituted some tenants' rights. If, if you're over 60, they will look at you a little bit differently. And if you've been in a place for over 10 years, but still, I think the forces of change, gentrification, being priced out of markets is something that, forget about just old people, young people are feeling that now. Mm -hmm. uh, quite severely. So the world, it, it, you know, when I wrote the story, it was in place, but now I think it's even worse. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but what an ingenious idea to come up with, <laughs> with Mary, you know, intercessing, but also like having the nerve to, to fake it, you know, why not fake it? And I thought that was kind of funny. Right. Too. Yeah. Like with all the belief yeah. systems. Yeah. Right. Right. So people yeah. have said, well, but they're devout. Why would they do that? It seems like I said, well, that's old world stuff. They were very happy to, you know, put St. Anthony upside down in a laundry basket because they were mad at him. Mm -hmm. There was a sense you could maybe not marry and certainly not Jesus or God, but you could get mad at saints because they were supposed to be your pals and they weren't helping. Right, right. She, um, she, the description of Tia Connie is that, uh, let's see, Normally, she was a goddess of sorts of equilibrium, though she ate as she pleased. She was thin. She was 50, but her hair was pure black and she did not dye it. Her skin was perfect, soft as an eggshell, or I'm sorry, as an eggplant, which is why once when I had acne boiling on my cheek, she dragged me to a lamp, pointed at my face and said, what is that? As if she were a creature from another planet. 
and I yelled with shame and slapped her. But instead of hitting me back, she punched the lamp. And I thought, that was so funny. Like, okay, so there's that tells you there's so many layers of description in that. I mean, it's not just a physical description that we get of her, but you know, like we know now that she is, you know, 50, but she still sounds quite beautiful, um, but has never married and is a virgin. And, and then she, she verges on, you know, sort of shaming Isabel about the acne, but then she punches the lamp. So it's almost like, it, I don't know, it gave her a lot of com complexity for me. I wasn't sure quite to, what to think of her there. And I liked that. It wasn't a cat description. I, I'm I'm glad. I think it it's a moment that shows their relationship, which is contentious, which is, you know, Connie is not the most sensitive person in the world, but she loves Isabel and mm -hmm. cares for her. But if you're if your child slaps you, what do you do? Right. And the solution is to punch an object and also possibly with a realization that what she just did to a teenager is pretty horrible. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, they have such banter and there's so much beautiful language that, you know, I almost missed how um, Isabel's father died, um, you know, took his own life. Her mm -hmm. mother leaves with the dentist. Um, for some reason in the first reading of the story, that almost passed me by because you just sort of slipped it in. And I wondered at the way that you were able to include something so devastating and yet not have that take over the story. That must have been an interesting. I, I recall that that was a difficult, how do you get this bit of exposition in? And, you know, I thought that a lot of the immigrants from the Azores to that area worked in the dairies. They mm -hmm. worked in the ranches of California. My father went to college and taught high school, but a lot of them were dairy men. And so picturing him all in white, just like broken from the sky was the image that came to me. I, I write in images and my challenge as a writer, and this is has always been the case, is to what's the story what's happening next to keep myself honest so are you saying because you could get just distracted by all the images and just well yeah 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 <laughs> you know when i the the process of doing a novel is even more so which is i i worked with editors acknowledging this is my issue help me and i can't see the forest for the trees and we mowed down a lot of trees and brought the main storyline to the surface. And honestly, my biggest reward so far is advanced readers saying, oh, it's very poetic, but the plot moves so adeptly and it's so many twists and turns I didn't expect. And I couldn't ask for better news that, yeah. that I think instead, I, I know my strength as a writer and I, I do want to preserve that. I want to honor that and keep that. But I also always want to challenge myself like what do i as a writer need to address how do i do that and we all have our strengths and weaknesses but i've always been one who wants to without fussing over it to say how do i tell even a better story how do i tell something more beautiful stronger what do I, what do i do i think for the rest of my life i will ask myself that because i think as a writer that's that's my aim, not to mm -hmm. say, oh, I figured it out. I'm never going to figure it out. Yeah. So the strengths of the descriptions, the humor, all that, what would you say? So the plot would be something that would be a weakness for you or just so getting, I, getting... I, I think the, the, my sensibility changed quite it's some time ago now when I realized that putting those things separately was the, was the error that you can't say, okay, a plot is like this Christmas tree and I'm going to stick all these ornaments on it. Or, or it's like these girders I have to stick into this beautiful wash of glorious things I've spilled out of my head. I think once it all feels organic, it's all the same thing. It's all tendent upon the other thing. Once I made that leap, I it really changed how I saw 
what I needed to do, how I see writing. There, you know, a secret is that I very early on started studying screenplays, believe it or not, for like, what's the main storyline? How do I look at an, a story with this kind of X-ray vision? How do you tell a creative, beautiful story that's different and yet there's a spine in it and that everything is connected to that? It's not a separate thing that I stick things on. So I, I once that's taught- a, That's a great idea, actually. Yeah, well, yeah. It, it is and it's helpful. And then you just drink that in and you you absorb it and it becomes intuitive and you don't separate it. I remember a course I taught once called Plotting for Poets. And it was, it, wow. was, it was mobbed because no one wants to say, um, oh, okay, I need help with this. And a lot of creating creative writing workshops, you don't get a lot of those tools. So I wanted to teach myself, how do you make forward drive? How do you create shape? And in a way that's even more adventurous because you're sculpting this moving thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I, I always want to figure out how, how do you tell a story that people sink into and don't want to flee from? I also love to make people cry. So when Alexander Cheek told me that I was delighted, <laughs> but I, yeah. he, he laughed before as well. So that's important to me too. Absolutely. Well, there's, uh, I was reading the, um, one of your blurbs where they were talking about the idea of, and I, I don't know if I'm going to say it correctly, so dad, so dad. So dad. Yeah. yeah. The Brazilians say it differently. They say so dad, but um, so dad is, is a very important Portuguese word. Mm -hmm. And meaning? It means it's supposed to be beyond definition, but it, it means a kind of longing for what you were missing in a way that it's the absence is the biggest presence in your life. It's a sweet sorrow. It's missing someone you still already have. It's a melancholy that you treasure. It's a state of being. I mean, there are all sorts of definitions. And once you pin it down to one thing, people will come up with another one. Right. But that kind of longing, I think, I think, you know, if you're Irish, you will identify with this, which is if you're from the Azores, that people, the, People grew up to leave their children yeah. left. There was, and so Ireland, same thing. And a lot of people, you know, as the world changes, that's a common thing now. And that kind of longing or missing is is prevalent in a lot of certainly photo music, but also I hope in a lot of my stories, including this one. Absolutely, and I think uh, all the ghosts, the magic, and everything is a way to keep that alive in a new location you know it's sort of like a you know I always used to like be like god could the Irish you know my dad could you talk about any more dead people like he was just you know <laughs> always so and then you know then she you know ascended into heaven and blah 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 I mean there were always these fantastical stories about when people died these amazing things that happened and right. but but there was the idea that it wasn't it wasn't about the sadness or grief it was about keeping it, them alive, making them larger than life, like creating this mythology around them. And and it was, I think, uh, that same feeling, I would describe it the same way, though, so da, so dad. Yeah, just of like this tender grief, but that is also beautiful that you want to ruminate on or that you that you want to spend time with. You're not trying to avoid it. Um, I don't know I if that's, that's right. Um as you know, you and I grew up in American culture, and there is this mantra about moving on, getting over mm -hmm. things, letting go. For a while back there, a lot of people would say, I have no regrets, and they would mean about absolutely everything. And I would mm -hmm. always think, you don't? It just seems to <laughs> right. you oh, should, as a human being, regret something. <laughs> but that kind of sweet sorrow that you keep, and that we keep inside because everyone has their own griefs. Everyone has their own histories they're nursing. And I think That's writing in part, I'm never upset when I read a story that's supposedly sad or melancholy or sorrowful or upsetting because it, it makes me feel less lonely. It does taps into something. So yeah, it's a, it's a community. It, it has a feel of community. Yeah, this, you know. this Aunt Connie I had, what really struck me above all was that when she fell in love and married 
a man that she only had him for 10 years because he died mm -hmm. of leukemia. Mm -hmm. But she was so content after that. She missed mm -hmm. him. She grieved for him. But I remember that thing people say about marriage is a lot of work and et cetera. And it should be 50-50 was a, was a yeah. expression I think we still use. But she, I remember her sitting on a couch next to me. She said very quietly, he was never work. His name was Antonio. He was never work. And it was a hundred, a hundred. Wow. And she said, we didn't, we weren't, we were never split. And she was, it, this was later in her life. She was 50 when she met him. So then she lived another 30 years. So she had this bloom in the middle of her life. And it gave her peace even when mm -hmm. it was gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's beautiful. It it was. And I think even as a child, that re that's what registered with me. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing she said about the virgin on the wall immediately in my consciousness connected to um, that love story. Mm -hmm. Well, there's something about, so there are the three miracles, right? Um, so first <laughs> she, uh, they go to the Holy ghost festival and right. she is not chosen as the queen. And, and we had that too. Like the queen is, that's a big deal. We right. I think ours was the Queen, I don't know, Mary, Queen of Peace or something. There was a peace festival that <laughs> at my church. But did you it, have those grand capes as well? Beautiful ornate capes with that, or is it just a yeah. ceremony? Either your parent would buy a dress or make you a dress, and then you'd have like a crown. Oh, Mary, I think it was the May Queen, the May Queen. Okay, and that was a big one too. But I got the, you know, so it's a big deal. But she's not chosen, and then she's walking behind Lucia, and and oh, then she. Yeah. So that's an interesting. So I, I love that because it was so unexpected. She trips her, this crippled girl, and then she cures her accidentally. I mean, where did that, that idea come from? You know, in fiction, we pick up these little pieces and put them together. And sometimes they're things that are outside the, you might say, the realm of the story and material. There was a, there was a woman I knew in my 20s who walked with a crutch that it turned out to be fake. She just did it for sympathy. She always mm -hmm. used it. Oh but my she God. Was fine. Her, oh. you know, and she just did this because she wanted attention or sympathy or something. And it wow. Just <laughs> that, <laughs> that that if you want ambiguity and well, okay, was this a miracle or did she just do what should have been done to this woman was slightly realign her knee and she'd be fine. Um, was it a miracle or not? And it's the hunger of people to want it to be so. Right. To, be, to be chosen. So that floated into my mind when I was writing it. Okay. Writing the story. I was just curious. Okay. So, and then I've always heard about the rule of three, you know, like it's a good idea to have three things happen. And, and then of course the third one is the most realistic of all of them. I mean, they meet, they fall in love and they get the three years of marriage. And and then, yes. yeah, Isabel is, I mean, they get to stay in the apartment, which is amazing. Yeah, it became Isabel's story of, you know, the anxiety of who, at, who am I in the world? Does this boy love me? Does the, the, the things you go through as a teenager, mm -hmm. it's something quite bigger was in her life, which was the idea that you get these gifts sometimes, and sometimes they're enormous, but they are also temporary. Mm -hmm. and that the risk of loving is such that your sorrow will be equal to the joy you were given. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, little little things that I want to ask before we get to the ending. Um, Celine and Julie go boating. I was just curious if there was any significance to the movie. Obsessed with that movie, <laughs> in the story. So I thought I have to put it in. Uh, uh, I don't. Yeah. I've never heard of that movie before. Oh, it's it's kind of a metal candy on a boat. I haven't seen it in ages. It was a cult favorite for a long time. Okay, back, back in the day, I'm afraid to watch it now and think. What was I thinking? Um, <laughs> what is but I? I really really obsessed with it. Okay. What and what is it about exactly? Is it they just go well, and they there was some magic in it because it was so long ago. I don't entirely remember. But it it they would 
eat a piece of candy while they were on a boat and go back to this mystery occurring in a house where they would see something terrible that had happened. So it was piecing together a story based on what amounted to a magical invocation to go there and be invisible and see it. Okay. Somebody's going to watch that movie and say, what was she talking about? Is that <laughs> I don't totally remember. But it's good because you um, you have that like bit of magic in the movie. And then there's this, the mystery spot in Santa Cruz, another thing I had never heard of before. So there, let, those are moments in the real world that are offering some mystery. That's magical realism, which is yeah. it's a real place where magnetic forces, I mean, a ball will roll up an incline. There are magnetic poles that are just strange there. And that was a real place. I wonder if it's still there. It is because I, well, I think so because I Googled, <laughs> I Googled it just to read more about it. So there's still a website and... It well, looks bless like you their can visit. Hearts. Bless their hearts. <laughs> <laughs> you can still visit. Um, yeah. Okay, so the ending is a really interesting craft thing to talk about because sure. at the ending, Rui says he would like to see her baby one day, and she's shocked because she's like, "Baby, what baby?" And then she says it's going to be a girl, and then she says the name will be Clara, which means light or gap or opening, clarity. And then, so I wanted to talk about the last part where she is directly addressing Clara and it's as if she's right. As yes. if she's, she's been telling her the story the whole time and we didn't know, but it was interesting because a lot of times you'll have a frame in the beginning of a story and then the frame at the end, let me tell you a story, Clara. And then you go into the story and then, but you, you dispensed with that at the beginning. Well, I, I leave it to the reader to, I think there are different interpretations of this and okay. I leave it to the reader to say, and I, I'm a big, advocate of that a story is completed when readers say oh i saw this and this and i read it this way well, i love that mm -hmm. and as we all know that's not always that i did you know a writer doesn't always see that but right um, i thought that's her deliverance into her future whatever that is and that the i happen to have a passion for artichokes i think they're a wonderful item on the earth talk about magical realism I love they artichokes. Do, uh, yeah, they yeah. do all this work and you get this, one of the best tastes in the world is an artichoke card. And it's so beautiful and pure. And it's it's also just a great symbol. Symbols work beautifully when they are a real thing in the world that has actual, you know, foot in front of the other sort of meaning and, and also when they're symbols and Artichokes really do taste good and are a gift. They're, that's real magical realism. And also they're a metaphor for take the thorns out, dig, and then lift it up and consume it. And, and it's wonderful. So I think she is delivering herself thanks to her dying, would he be a stepfather, married mm -hmm. to her great um, raising her. Mm -hmm. She He also gifts her with a father he brings her own father back from the dead um she's been longing for a father mm -hmm. and with this kind of beautiful sorrow she sees a child named perhaps clara maybe she'll have a boy maybe she'll have a girl maybe she won't have children at all but clara also means can mean clarity and mm -hmm. and clearness and that she sees here's what life can be so that's her vision, and it could be a real child, but it could also be that she is giving him a sense that she will not forget him, and that she'll be and that she'll be okay no matter. So that it's okay. yeah, yeah. Oh, so that's interesting. See, I thought that's so fascinating. I thought we were leaping forward in time, and that I love that because you know you you've given me something that 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 the invisible frame at the beginning is. She is telling that story when she's older. Uh -huh. So she's speaking to Clara at the end. I think it makes perfect sense that she's framing the story with yeah. this kind of actual person. Yeah. Um, I know we're almost out of time and I want to just quickly talk about the book, but I wanted to mention one la a couple other things that stuck with me, which were the bleach bottle purses. <laughs> I oh, was they like, all had those. They oh, all my God. <laughs> you remember those too? 
No, no, we didn't have that. No, oh, but I, I was thinking, my God, like <laughs> you better get all the bleach out of there. Whatever you put in there is going to be <laughs> like, you don't want to put your- is no more. Okay. And what they would do is they would cut bleach bottles in half. They would clean them out and then they would knit or crochet tops them so they could hold their oh. bingo markers when they went to bingo at the church. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes fiction preserves these sort of time capsules of objects that are gone off the earth. But that <laughs> but that's was, ingenious. Oh, that was a working class Catholic thing all these older women had. And then the quilt I thought was kind of cool too. So she had the quilt that was her mother's and then she wanted to like burn it into ash. <laughs> She's like, right. you, yeah. You, you know, the idea is that you burn thing. You probably remember that we were taught never throw away a holy card. You can only yes, burn yes. to something pure, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, no, if it was, uh, if it was blessed or something, you had to burn it. Right. Yeah. Right. Which yeah. seems kind of intuitive to me now. Because <laughs> <laughs> I remember burning like a statue of uh, Mary, you know, like had to go, but you had, we had to build a bonfire and burn it, which was bizarre. But that is quite wonderful. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's quickly. So I love the book. Um, can you just mention a little bit about the salt? Um, thank you. It's my novel that I've been working on for over 15 years. Wow. It's Above the Salt, and it's coming out on November 7th from Flatiron Books, Macmillan. I once again give a immigration story in part that's based on a true story, which was a group of Madeirans on the Portuguese island of Madeira were converted to Presbyterianism, violently driven off the island, and they were adopted, believe it or not, by Jacksonville and Springfield, Illinois, during the time of Lincoln. Wow. So I came across the story of someone named John Alves, who had grown up in jail with his mother, who was um, in prison for heresy. And he met and courted a woman named Mary. He met in the Lincoln household. He went away to the Union Army and returned and then wandered the West for decades before he found, found her again. It's, you know, obviously my uh, high bar was love in the time of cholera, and it was kind of a Portuguese cold mountain, I hope, as well. But this is a novel that I, I've just put my heart and soul into. And I think, as I said earlier, my biggest delight has been that people said, it's so poetic. I had to put the book down and let it weigh. But also that the plot is so intriguing and there are twists and turns that are surprising and wonderful and it's very fast paced. So I owe a lot to the editors I work with. I worked with an editor named Megan Lynch and then a freelance editor even before that named Randall Klein, who was amazing and helped me with momentum, but also preserving my strengths. So I'm really proud of this novel and um, it got a starred review in Publishers Weekly. And then when I it saw that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Curtis, which is harder to get, they're, they're tough. And so I'm fingers crossed, cautiously excited. One last thing for all the aspiring writers out there. How did you keep the mo like keep going for 15 years. I'm just curious, like, did you, you must've had moments where you're like, it's never gonna, I'm never I gonna did. I had many obstacles. I had many disappointments. Uh, when I lost my father, the grief was such that I didn't touch it for a year. Wow. What I learned that is helpful is that I've always, if you quit, then it is done. So I always thought I will try there, there does, and, and you're mindful of the fact that sometimes things should be abandoned. Sometimes projects are not what you should be doing and should be stopped. But I always felt like this was something in the spirit of this got into me and that I had to, that I would see it through. If there's something to say, it's that the anxiety about finishing needs to be replaced with patience, slowness, and love for the characters. Mm. And I had to stop and teach myself that because if you're pushing toward the finish line, it's like having a child, you're pushing toward doing something and they think, I don't want to do it. 
Right. But kind of sitting and waiting upon and letting the characters falling in love again with them and slowing down rather than speeding up is um, counterintuitively a lot faster. Right. And, and finding a joy in it. Why am I doing this? Because not just this is who I am, but that's what this story is. And that's who these people are that I'm bringing to life. Mm -hmm. And it's something that you maybe you'd want to read yourself, you know, like you kind of are writing a story that you'd want to read too, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. You know, there's a funny story where I teach in the Disquiet program in Lisbon every summer and um, uh, Richard Zenith mm -hmm. wrote a biography of the Portuguese poet, Fernando Pessoa. It took him 20 years. And someone said to him, oh, you must be mourning that it's done now and that it's out. And he said, actually, no. I'm just <laughs> right. so relieved. So I was at first totally relieved. And now I have the joy of the book again. I mean, sometimes I just, this is a kind of a, I guess, a sweet admission. I sometimes just sit with it in my arms and I think, here you are. Oh. I wish my father were alive to see it and celebrate it. I wish my mother were alive because I lost her not even a year ago. I'm sorry. She always wrote me a long letter of congratulations and very heartwarming after every one of my books. And this one, I won't get one from her. Right. So it it's in a way, the idea of mortality that seeped into this book got into my system as well, which is how do we honor the truth about human life and yet go forward. I mean, that right. Samuel Beckett line about, I can't go on, I'll go on. And so right. that was my mantra. Mm -hmm. But I think getting frustrated or upset or impatient are some of the biggest blocks. So that I can say to aspiring writers, I think. Right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate Thank you talking you. to me. I, it's been a great thrill. And congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for all the great questions and for the chance to do this. This was great. Thank you. Bye. Thanks to Elliot Bansell for editing this podcast. We look forward to seeing you next month when I interview Jai Chakrabarty. For more information on the story we'll be talking about and to find out more about what's going on with the podcast in general, please visit kellyforden.com. If you can, please consider a donation. I don't have sponsors or advertisers, so even the smallest donation would be a huge help. You can find the donation button on kellyforden.com as well. Until next month.